Steven Spielberg's historical drama, The Post, is up for Best Picture at this Sunday's Oscars. It tells the real-life story of the 20th century's most famous whistleblower, the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers almost 50 years ago. Daniel Ellsberg risked everything to tell Americans the Nixon government was lying to them about the Vietnam War, a conflict Washington knew it couldn't win. I met Ellsberg recently to talk about that leak and about another one he was planning. At the core of it, an intense drama. At night, over several months, his heart pounding, Daniel Ellsberg copies thousands of Defense Department documents. Proof the U.S. government was lying about its role in the Vietnam War. Ellsberg exposes that lie to the world. The New York Times has started publication of a series of reports based on a top secret Pentagon study of the Vietnam War. The central fact so far revealed is that there was a massive deception of the American public for starting the bombing of North Vietnam. Hey, stop it! Ellsberg was walled off by a mob of newsmen and supporters as he admitted that he was indeed the man who brought the Pentagon Papers to the press and congressional leaders. I can no longer cooperate in concealing this information from the American public. Wouldn't you go to prison to tell us this war? He's a fellow that worked over with Ellsberg who worked in the Defense Department, and by golly, we're going to get him, and he's going to go to jail. In Oval Office recordings, the sound of Nixon's angry voice charging at Daniel Ellsberg. Hello, yes, Mr. President. I just say that we've got to keep our eye on the main ball. The main ball is Ellsberg. We've got to get this son of a bitch. And uh, it, just because some guy's going to be a martyr uh, of allowing the fellow to get away with this kind of wholesale thievery, or otherwise it's going to happen all over the government. He's signing his death warrant as a president. He's signing his impeachment warrant. We've got to have a united front on Ellsberg. That's the main thing. Uh, I haven't heard that. Can work with him or not? Sure. We'll do. What, what's it like to hear the president talk about you like that? Well, I hear him hanging himself. You know, when I hear that, I hear a president making the decision by putting him, me on trial that actually led to his resignation facing impeachment and made the war endable. Ben? Damn. The study had 47 volumes. I slipped out a couple at a time. It took me months to copy it all. The story of the Pentagon Papers is legendary. What the hell? Well, Steven Spielberg's take is now up for an Oscar. But possibly the more intriguing tale is that Ellsberg had copied a second set of documents, government plans for nuclear war. He considered those papers more important, more frightening. As he lays out in his new book, The Doomsday Machine, he'd actually planned to release those papers first. What was in the nuclear papers that, that haunted you? The estimates by the Joint Chiefs of how many they would kill if we initiated nuclear war. And what was the estimate? The estimate amounted to, in total, in their eyes, 600 million dead. Now, that's not genocide. There's no single ethnic group with 600 or 100 million people. It's multi-genocide. Uh, it's 100 holocausts. That's really what I'm saying in the large is going on here. Nuclear war is a catastrophe waiting to happen. If we don't change our course, our, our policy, I don't think we get through another 70 years as we have now. I think it's been miraculous that we haven't had a blow up. Now, miraculous, not, not just good luck, but far beyond good luck. Very unpredictable. This is a devastating security breach that was leaked out of the Pentagon. The most highly classified documents of the war. You know, I think people who experience your story for the first time through the movie, uh, as, as some will, uh, will get a sense of, of how tense it must have been. The FBI is looking for you because of the Pentagon Papers, but you still have the stash of nuclear papers. Yes. And so you give them to your brother, Harry. Correct. Yes. And what does he do with them? He put both of them in a, in a garbage bag, green big garbage bag, inside a box, wooden mm. uh, cardboard box. 
and eventually buried it in a trash dump underneath a large green stove. And then a tropical storm, Doria, a hurricane, came along and moved the stove by about 100 yards, so you know. And uh, the bluff went down over the hill. And for a year and a half of searching, including part of the time with a backhoe, he found a lot of bags with green garbage bags, but none with top secret none. documents inside. So uh, they were lost. So tonight I have the great honor of introducing to you the author most recently of The Doomsday Machine, Daniel Ellsberg. Now 86, Ellsberg seems seized with the same urgency of nearly 50 years ago. Maybe more so with all the nuclear posturing between the U.S. and North Korea. I'm very, very worried about the North Korean situation, and of course they mentioned that in their move. North Korea doesn't have thermonuclear weapons yet, and that's the excuse that Trump is using, and he's built this up very much. We've got to stop them before they get an H-bomb. A sense of doom that bad things can and do happen has been with Ellsberg almost his whole life. Family tragedy taught him that. I, I find it a, a slightly heart-stopping element of your story about your family and, and the car crash. But do you mind telling me ab about that and, and what, what that did to your brain? Well, I am a person, obviously not unique, but unusual, who experienced the disaster uh, on July 4th, 1946, when I was 15, when uh, my father went to sleep at the wheel of a car, hit a culvert, killing my mother and sister. My sister was 11 months younger. So I was put in a coma for three and a half days, actually, long coma. But I do think that experience opened me to the possibility that other people find it very hard to imagine, that your world can change disastrously very suddenly. I never really blamed either my mother or my father for that. We always called it the An accident. accident. Yeah, the accident. It could happen to anybody. As if a car had crashed into us, for example, no difference. But actually, that's not what happened. My mother was determined to get to Denver uh, by a certain day, she didn't want to drive. She wanted my father mm -hmm. to do all the driving. He wanted to stop and rest by the side of the road. And she said, no, we don't have time for that. We've got to keep going. And he was gambling not only with his own life and my mother's, and my mother was gambling by telling him to go on. Both of them were gambling with the lives of their children. And my sister lost that, that gamble. Good people make bad decisions. Well. Uh, you know, and are they, they're not good in every respect. People who are in many respects very good and decent uh, can not only make bad decisions, terrible, not, not just bad, you know, but evil, monstrous, horrible decisions, but the mass of people under them will obey, will follow, will go along, even though they know that it's wrong. Back here, Daniel. This now looks like one of these people when they find him, you know, dead for, for <laughs> eight days. A lot of newspapers. Oh, oh. Mm. It feels like this goes on forever. <sighs> what is all this? Your whistleblower project? Haha. <laughs> That's a good one. I get the feeling you could get lost for days in here. Days? Years? <laughs> hmm. This is interesting. You know, oh, a petition. The U.S. shall not resort to the use of atomic bombs. 18 people saw the phone in July. That's before the first test, see? <laughs> they wanted to prevent a test. This thing was kept classified at the time, not published for long after. And then when they did publish it, they wouldn't let them publish the names of the people who aren't. And those got uh, announced. Ah, this is good. This is very interesting. Can you bring that with you? Yeah. People were so shocked, it sounds like, when the Pentagon Papers came out and, and they read the truth. 
Well, that and, they'd been lied to. What was shocking was that they had been lied to so much. But they believed what they read. Do you sometimes look at this culture now and think, you know, if there was a massive leak, people might not actually believe it? You know, something is going on as we speak. Uh, we have a president for the first time who is attacking the press openly, publicly. Now, Nixon privately thought of the press as the enemy, but he didn't say that publicly. To use the word enemy is potentially quite dangerous. But I think you're right in saying the press would not be believed by a lot of his supporters. But that's true even if documents came out. If on, if now, uh, they wouldn't believe it. So, yes, the, the president is making a direct assault on credibility, and that didn't happen with the Pentagon Papers. If there was one document right now, or one set of documents that you think need to be leaked, that you oh. would like to get your hands on, what do you think they are? <clears throat> it would be documents that I am certain exist in the Pentagon and in CIA and even in probably in the White House that would reveal their estimates, official estimates, of how many people would die over there in South Korea and Japan and conceivably the United States as a result of a war with a nuclear weapon state, North Korea. Uh, I think the president himself, by the way, may be under a delusion about this, that he can attack and keep the attack limited, mm -hmm. that there will be no response because of our ability to annihilate North Korea. I'm certain there are estimates who say that's not right. He doesn't believe them, but that's not true. There will be an, uh, retaliation and it will be soon. I would like those leaked now. This is your call out then for someone to leak those? Yes, oh absolutely. I have no doubt that if a Chelsea Manning or Ed Snowden or I had access to such information now with a war looming and possibly imminent, we would put it out with the expectation of going to prison for the rest of our lives or frankly being killed if that could stop our revelations. Uh, and possibly being killed in retaliation for doing this. Daniel Ellsberg, you're very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Very kind, and almost 50 years after the leak of the Pentagon Papers, still very intense. Totally intense. And, and what he says makes him afraid is the casual nature with which people speak about nuclear weaponry now. Uh, he thinks people are numb to it. He is terrified by the language on Twitter. And, and, you know, as he gets older, he gets more frantic about it. Last thought about that crawl space. It, it, you know, it, it's amazing. It's a very worrying thing to look at all that documentation and the bend in the in the house frame from the last earthquake wow. and you just realize one more earthquake one ugly flood and all that history is gone wow.